What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video, we're gonna be talking about epidural hematoma. Before we get started, please, it is just so crucial that in order for you guys to continue to help us to make these videos for you guys' enjoyment, please hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, throw some comments down in the comment section. Also, as a preparation, kind of getting you guys ready, we are in the process of developing a website, getting that Ninja Nerd information out there to everybody. So please stay tuned for that. We'll have comprehensive notes notes, illustrations, question banks, flashcards, the whole nine to really aid in your academic journey. All right, Ninja Nerds, let's get into this. All right, Ninja Nerds, so when we talk about epidural hematoma, we know that it's basically a hematoma or a bleed that accumulates within the epidural space. So that deserves some a little discussion on the anatomy of some of the meninges and the brain tissue and the parenchyma and understanding a little bit about that stuff. So let's say that we take here, we're having a coronal section, right? And we're looking at this from the front view and we're having the skull here, the brain parenchyma, and then there's some meninges between the brain parenchyma and the skull. We really wanna zoom into that and to look at that kind of at the really, really microscopic or tissue level. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. When we zoom in here on to this portion, we get a couple different layers that we have to know. And they're gonna be obvious, and this should be a nice review, right? So the first one is this brown layer, that's the bone. All right, so that's the most obvious one. So that's gonna be the actual bone of the skull. Okay, the next one is this green layer, this darkish green layer. This one here, right underneath the bone, kind of clinging to it, it's actually a part of the dura matter, and we can just say dura matter, but we gotta be a little bit specific. Since it's the part that's clinging to the bone, we call that the periosteal layer of the dura mater, right? So we call that the peri osteal layer of the dura mater. Now, the next thing is that you have a space, technically, uh, between the periosteal layer of the dura mater, that green one, and this purple one, which is another layer of the dura mater. We just call that purple layer there, we call that the uh, meningeal layer of the dura mater. Okay, so we'll call this one the meningeal layer of the dura mater. Now, there's a space, and it's called a potential space, that exists between the periosteal layer of the dura mater and the meningeal layer of the dura mater. And that technically is called the epidural space. And that is where the blood will accumulate. Now, just for thoroughness sake, and it's always good practice, let's go through the other layers, just as a good repetition for that. So the next one is this kind of beautiful baby blue layer. What is that one called? That's called the arachnoid matter, right? So that's called your arachnoid matter. And it's called the arachnoid matter just because it looks like a spider because of all these little trabricular extensions that are coming out of it. Then, it's important to remember there is a, a space between the meningeal layer of the dura mater and the arachnoid mater. And that is called the subdural space. So whenever we talk about subdural hematomas, that's where they'll be. The next one is this pink layer just deep to that arachnoid matter, and that is called the pia mater. So the pia mater is what clings nice and tight to this black layer here, and that is gonna be called the brain tissue, right? So that we're just gonna put parenchyma, because this could be the brain or it could be the spinal cord. We'll just put the parenchyma of the tissue of the brain or the spinal cord in this case, okay? So we'll put parenchyma of the central nervous system. How's that? Let's be very specific, okay? So we have all the layers here, and what I want you guys to remember again, is the space, the technical space in the actual skull and the cranium is between the periosteal layer of the dura mater and the meningeal layer of the dura mater. That is the epidural space and that's where the blood will accumulate. Now, let's take a little second here to actually zoom in really between the bone and the periosteal layer. There's a blood vessel that loves to run in there, okay? And there's a couple different types, but the most common one that we'll talk about in a second is called the middle meningeal artery. There's another one called the anterior ethmoidal artery, less common though. Either way, there's uh, some arteries that run between the bone and between that green layer. What's that green layer? The periosteal layer of the dura mater. So that's an artery, okay? And again, this artery could be the middle meningeal artery, it could be the anterior ethmoidal artery. Most commonly, we'll just put here M, M A, this isn't mixed martial arts, this is the middle meningeal artery. What happens is for some reason, we'll talk about the reasons, you damage that middle meningeal artery. And then the blood starts seeping in between that green layer and in between that purple layer. 
and that can lead to an epidural hematoma. So we have a basic understanding of the anatomy and how whenever there's this injury or damage to the middle meningeal artery, the blood will start to seep and pour in between that epidural space. Now, let's talk about the etiologies and the pathophysiology of epidural hematomas. All right, engineers, so let's talk about epidural hematomas. Now, we kind of discussed already what an epidural hematoma is. We talked about the anatomy to make sense of where the bleed will actually kind of accumulate. Now, let's talk about the different types of epidural hematomas. And really, this should be a very brief discussion because one of them is extremely way more common than the other, but we have to be thorough, right? So there's an arterial type of epidural hematoma, which is the much, much, much more common type. And we already kind of mentioned that a little bit below within the bottom part of the anatomy section. The venous epidural hematomas aren't as common, but you should be thinking about them. Now, arterial epidural hematomas primarily occur due to the laceration of, two, of, of, of one particular artery most common. And so let's actually write that down here. So the first one here is it's usually due to a laceration of the middle meningeal artery. And the middle meningeal artery, if you guys remember, we have what's called the external carotid artery. And then the external carotid artery will give off what's called the maxillary artery. And then from the maxillary artery, you'll have the middle meningeal artery, which will run up through the foramen spinosum and then it'll actually give off some branches here. Now, there is particularly one common location that you have to remember where the middle meningeal artery is the most susceptible to being actually like damaged. And that is this area here, kind of where the coronal suture and the squamous suture meet, and that's called the terion. So the terion is a very thin piece of bone, and it tends to be the most common location that if you actually cause any type of trauma to that area and break the bone, it's so thin that it can lacerate the middle meningeal artery. And so in this case, you're actually hitting that middle meningeal artery, okay? So it's not MMA like <laughs> mixed martial arts, okay? The other location, Again, less common, but if you get a really good fracture to like the skull base, so you actually get a skull brace fracture, what can happen is you can lacerate the middle meningeal artery as it enters in through the foramen spinosum. So if you get a skull base type of fracture or injury, this can hit the beginning point of the middle meningeal artery. Okay, so very important to remember that. More common is gonna be the terion. Now the other branch, there's another branch called the anterior ethmoidal artery, and that's usually gonna be running here in the front, and that's due to a fracture usually of like the frontal bone, less common. But if there's some type of frontal bone involvement, fracture, injury there, this may take out what's called the anterior ethmoidal artery. Again, less common. The big thing that I want you guys to take away from this, most important part here, is this aspect here. Injury to the terion is the most common location where you lacerate the middle meningeal artery. Okay, the next one is venous epidural hematomas. Now, if you guys remember, running between, you have what's called the periosteal layer of the dura mater, and then the meningeal layer of the dura mater. When they break apart into these areas like falx, like the falx cerebri or the tentorium, they form these little septa which protect dural venous sinuses. And so sometimes when there's injury to particular venous sinuses, it can cause epidural hematomas in very specific locations. So the first one to remember is, what if I develop an injury to what's called the superior Sagittal sinus. This is a very common one um, to remember. So superior sagittal sinus. This will produce a kind of a bloody appearance that'll come at the vertex. You can't see that in this kind of view. It would be coming out, like it's gonna punch you, coming out towards the camera. But this would generally appear near the vertex if you were to do like a CT scan. The other one, is usually if it's kind of like in the middle cranial fossa, you see bleeding or epidural type of hematoma here in this presentation in the middle cranial fossa, that could be due to what's called a sphenoparietal sinus. So the sphenoparietal sinus may produce kind of an epidural hematoma that presents within the middle cranial fossa as we see over here to the right. Okay, because anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, posterior cranial fossa. 
The last one, which is going to be the most common, is that you have some veins that run here, right? So you have what's called the transverse sinuses, you have the sigmoid sinuses, and then they run down into your jugulars. So sometimes if you hit these, that can also cause a bleed within the posterior fossa. So we'll say transverse and also sigmoid sinuses. And technically you even have the confluence that can show up there. But again, this will present in that posterior cranial fossa. Okay? So these are the two different types of epidural hematomas. Big thing to take away, if you guys forget all of this stuff, is that the most common is that the terion, very thin piece of bone, where the two sutures join, lacerating the middle meningeal artery. The next thing I need you guys to know is that by far the most common cause of an epidural hematoma where it's arterial, usually the most common, is trauma. Okay, It's going to be a traumatic type of injury. So some type of penetrating trauma or some type of blunt force trauma is going to be a very, very common cause. Okay, This is going to be by far the most common. Now, what if it is a non-traumatic cause, which is less common, but it can happen. Sometimes, you know if people get infections um, of like their actual uh, external ear or inner ear, like middle ear actual area, particularly like if they have what's called an otitis media. So sometimes if people can get what's called otitis media, or they develop what's called mastoiditis, these infections, can actually spread from the bone to the area where the blood vessel is and cause necrotic damage to the blood vessel. And if you damage this middle meningeal artery, what can happen? Some of that blood can actually leak out from that vessel, and if it leaks out from that vessel, it can empty into that, epidur uh, uh, that epidural space. Okay? So sometimes this could be due to infectious causes. So we'll put here infectious causes that actually lead to kind of the necrotic damage of the actual middle meningeal artery, okay? Another kind of cause here is that someone is actually taking anticoagulants. So you know if someone is taking anticoagulants or they have very, very low platelets, they have a coagulopathy. Let's actually phrase it like that. So they have some underlying coagulopathy, okay? And maybe that coagulopathy is they have very low platelets. What is that called when you have very low platelets? thrombocytopenia, or they're on anticoagulants. Maybe they're on heparin, maybe they're on warfarin, maybe they're on Xarelto, some kind of medication. If this is the case, or maybe they're on what's called antiplatelets. Maybe they take aspirin, maybe they take clopidogrel. Either way, they have some underlying coagulopathy that's gonna alter the ability to form a clot when they need to. Naturally, Vessels undergo micro tears all of the time, and you should have enough platelets, and you should have full functionality of your coagulation system to plug up those micro tears. But what if you don't have that because you have low platelets or you're super therapeutic on your anticoagulants? These can actually leak, tear enough that it causes bleeds to form and leads to an epidural hematoma. Okay, the next one, again, not too common, but sometimes if you get a arterial venous malformation, this can also lead to an epidural hematoma. So we call these arterial venous malformations, AVMs. So whenever you have an arterial joint to a venule and you form this nidus, you don't have a true capillary bed there, this can cause a back pressure to build up within the venial side of these and this can lead to rupturing of these into the epidural space, okay? All right, so the last one, not as common, again, probably gonna be one of the least common out of these, is if someone has like a primary cancer from some location, like maybe they have melanoma, maybe they have lung cancer, and that cancer breaks off and spreads to another area of the body, particularly to the dura matter. And that actual uh, cancer, so whenever you can have what's called dural mets or metastases, you know, uh, cancers are very, very vascular, and so they can get a lot of uh, blood flow that can actually come from like the middle meningeal artery here or from some of the other blood vessels around this dura mater. And as they get lots of vascularity, that can lead to bleeding that can occur near where that dural met is. Okay, so again, really quick recap. What I really want you to take away from this is most common location, terion, where that sutures meet, 
tearing of the middle meningeal artery. The most common cause that leads to that blood vessel rupturing is trauma. Less common though could be infectious causes, coagulopathy, arterial venous malformations, or dural metastases. Okay, boom, roasted, let's start talking about some of the other pathophys and clinical features. All right, engineer, so we have a good understanding now about the causes of an epidural hematoma. Rupture of the middle meningeal artery, trauma, usually to the pterion, or the less common causes that we listed below. Now, what I want you to kind of have an idea of going into the clinical features is how significant of a mass effect epidural hematomas can have. So if we take, for example, let's say here we have a hepi epidural hematoma that's present in this coronal section. So here's all that epidural hematoma. Look what it's doing. It's causing a lot of mass effect and compression on that part of the brain. And what can start to happen is, with this massive amount of compression, first thing, you can develop focal deficits, but also it can start leading to a lot of things called herniation syndromes that we're gonna spend a decent amount of time talking about. One of the big things to know though is that there's a classic presentation that people come in with with epidural hematomas. First thing is since most commonly this is due to a traumatic event, usually there is initially a loss of consciousness. Okay, so LOC, there's a loss of consciousness, usually because of the concussive event that they had experienced. What happens after that is after they lose consciousness and the bleed starts to develop, our body tries to come up with a very nifty way to reduce the blood flow in the brain. And so what happens is after we lose consciousness and the blood actually begins to accumulate in the epidural space, our body will start shunting venous blood out of the brain. As it shunts venous blood out of the brain that tries to get less blood inside of, less blood is actually occupying the skull now, so now there's more like space for things to be able to move. And so that decreases the compression onto the frontal lobe. And what happens is after they lose consciousness, because of that venous shunting and kind of trying temporarily to decrease the compression on the frontal lobe, they develop what's called a lucid interval. This can happen in some individuals where they actually regain consciousness, they're relatively aware, they know what's going on, they're able to, you know, be, they're oriented, they're alert. What happens is that venous shunting from trying to get venous blood out of the brain to allow for less compression on the frontal lobe only works for a certain amount of time. So after the lucid interval usually goes away, they start to have this clinical deterioration. Now, how does this clinical deterioration start to present is the question. They can start to present with herniation syndromes and that's what we have to talk about. Now before we do that, it is also important to remember, we talked a lot about epidural hematomas, particularly with inside of the skull. But you know, you can have epidural hematomas that can actually occur along the spinal cord. It's just, if you guys remember, we don't technically have a meningeal layer and a periosteal layer around the spinal uh, cord. It's just a dura mater, like a spinal dura mater. And what happens is you can get epidural hematomas that can form between the bone and the dura mater. And these are called, so it's just important to remember that this is called a spinal, and we're going to abbreviate epidural hematoma. Well, as this one up here, this is called a intracranial epidural hematoma. And so we're kind of focusing a lot more on the intracranial epidural hematomas, but do realize you can get spinal epidural hematomas, and if they compress on the spinal cord, you can get symptoms of radiculopathy, pain in the back, you can get sensory deficits, urinary incontinence, a lot of things that it can sometimes present similar to like a cauda equina syndrome. Okay, so it's important to remember about that with spinal epidural hematomas. All right, so now that we have kind of a basic idea about what these should look like, Let's go ahead and start talking about some of these herniation syndromes and other clinical features. All right, so when we talk about uh, epidural hematoma and clinical features, a lot of the times they may present just with kind of a headache, right? That might be the common symptom that they can present with. Headache, they may have that loss of consciousness that they say, then they may have the lucid interval with clinical deterioration. But it's important to remember and pick out signs of herniation, because if you start seeing signs of kind of herniation syndromes, you need to employ emergent neurosurgical types of interventions. So what are some of these? The first one that I want you to talk about is because usually when people form epidural hematomas, they're primarily supratentorial. So what the heck do I mean by the tentorium, like supratentorial and infratentorial? If you guys remember, 
there is this purple layer here, right? That purple layer is called the meningeal layer of the dura mater. And then this green one here is called the periosteal layer of the dura mater. In certain areas, the meningeal layer will break away from the periosteal layer and form kind of these little septal partitions. We form kind of one here that is called the falx cerebri. We also form one that actually comes between kind of like where the, um, the cerebellum and the occipital lobe is. And that right there is called the tentorium cerebelli. And what happens is there's kind of like a little space. Imagine like a little slit here where you have the tentorium. What can happen is that little space, sometimes pieces of brain tissue can slip through that tentorial incision. And that is where we start seeing problems, especially with epidural hematomas. So for example, the first septa that I want you guys to remember is tentorium, but there's another one. There's another one that actually kind of runs here in between kind of that longitudinal fissure there. You guys remember what that one's called? We already said it's the falx cerebri. So this one right here is called the falx cerebri. Now let's say that someone has this bleed here in that right hemisphere, okay? It's compressing onto the brain tissue and creating a mass effect. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna try to start pushing this brain tissue towards the opposite side, the left side. As it does that, guess what happens? It starts kind of pushing parts of this brain matter underneath the falx cerebri. When it pushes it underneath the falx cerebri, it leads to this thing called subfalcine herniation. So what is this called whenever you start pushing the brain tissue underneath the falx due to a mass effect? That's called subfalcine herniation. This is gonna be by far one of the most common types of herniation syndromes that you're gonna see with supertentorial bleeds. Whenever somebody has this mass effect and they start shifting things towards past the midline, what, what, what becomes a problem with this, is, I guess, is the question. We have to remember your blood flow. Do you guys remember that the cir circle of Willis we had here, the internal carotid arteries, and then they give off the middle cerebrals, and then they give off what's called the anterior cerebral artery, which forms this anterior communicating, and then you give off the anterior cerebral artery here. This is kind of your A2 segment, if you guys remember. Well, look what, kind of imagine what would happen here if I had the bleed that was right here and it was pushing brain tissue underneath that falx. What is it gonna do to these vessels that are coming off of that anterior communicating? It's gonna compress them. If you compress these, you're gonna lead to a ACA type of syndrome. Oh, what happens if I get compression of these uh, anterior uh, 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 cerebral arteries, I can actually lead to, what does the anterior cerebral artery do for the motor cortex? It supplies the muscles that are going to what part of our body? The lower extremities or the upper extremities? The lower extremities. So what this could lead to is this could lead to lower extremity weakness. But remember that the anterior cerebral arteries not only supply the motor strip, but the sensory strip. So you would also develop sensory losses of what? the lower extremity. So you can develop lower extremity weakness and sensory loss. And that is one of the big, big things to remember here. Okay, and again, to kind of give you an idea of what this could look like is imagine here, you have that falx cerebri right there. And again, you have that mass effect. What's happening here is that pieces of this tissue is starting to kind of shift underneath here and really push onto the blood vessels that are going up into that area of the brain, okay? So again, big thing to remember with subfalcine herniation, you see this, one of the most common types, mass effect causing brain tissue on the affected side to push underneath the falx to the contralateral side, compressing the anterior cerebral arteries, leading to lower extremity weakness and sensory losses. Boom, roasted, move on to the next one. The next one is not as common, and believe it or not, you don't usually see this as commonly with a unilateral, or kind of, actually I should say more specifically, a one-sided bleed. You can see this more commonly in the terrible scenario where you would actually have two bleeds. Could you imagine that? Man, that would stink. But if you had two epidural hematomas, 
that we're compressing onto the brain tissue. What this would do is, is this would push almost equally on these sides. And you have this structure here kind of in the center, the subcortical region of the brain. What is that structure there called? The diencephalon, right, which contains the thalamus, the, you know, the epithalamus, your hypothalamus, a lot of structures there. Whenever there's bihemispheric epidural hematomas, it pushes the diencephalon down into the brainstem area. And when you push the diencephalon and shift it downwards, you push it through this little space here. What was this thing here called? See where the purple part's coming in beneath the occipital lobe and the cerebellum? The tentorium cerebelli. We're gonna push this past the tentorium, so it's called a transtentorial herniation, but you're shifting the diencephalon down. So what's gonna happen here? You're gonna develop what's called a diencephalic shift, is what we call this but it is a type of transtentorial herniation. Now, what can happen with these? You have to remember on your exams, they love to bring this dang thing up, but whenever you have this diencephalic shift, you can actually cause a lot of stress and shearing of the basilar artery. You know, the basilar artery supplies a good chunk of the pons. And so what can happen is they can develop these bleeds that accumulate within the pons, and it's a pretty ominous sign, and they call these durets hemorrhages. Okay, so whenever you look for what's called Durette's or Durette's hemorrhage, this could be a sign of basilar artery shearing due to maybe some type of diencephalic shift. What is the other thing that can happen here? Whenever you shift things down, you actually do something really interesting. You know the sympathetic fibers that comes from the hypothalamus has to run through the midbrain? and then eventually it'll run down here into the spinal cord. It'll give off fibers here that'll then go to the pupil and do what? Well, normally sympathetic fibers want to cause pupillary dilation. But if you have this diencephalic shift, you're pushing kind of parts of the hypothalamus into the midbrain, damaging the hypothalamus, damaging those fibers that are coming down to the midbrain. And so now you won't be able to allow for the pupils to actually dilate. They're more likely to maybe be a little bit more constricted. And so what happens is you may have these fixed pupils, they may be fixed pupils, meaning that they don't actually react to light, but on top of that, they may be small. So you may have more smaller pupils. Sometimes if you get enough midbrain compression, you can actually get mid position where you affect both the third nerve and the sympathetic fibers. But it's easier to remember that if you're really compressing and pushing that hypothalamus, you're more particularly affecting the sympathetic fibers and you'll get some fixed and kind of small pupils. Okay? So a big important thing to remember there. The next thing that you guys want to remember here is you actually can compress whenever you have this diencephalic shift. Sometimes it can compress onto the dorsal aspect of the midbrain. You know the dorsal aspect of the midbrain controls, it's kind of what we call this the dorsal midbrain. It's nice to remember this is kind of like the vertical gaze center is located in this area. So your vertical gaze center. So what it helps to do is it helps to be able to innervate the eyeball to be able to move the eyeball upwards, right? So a vertical up gaze is that's what you want to do. If due to that diencephalic shift, you damage the dorsal midbrain, you damage the vertical gaze center, you want someone to look up, are they going to be able to look up? No. So they aren't able to have this up gaze. So we call this an up gaze palsy, okay? So that's another thing that you wanna look for. The next thing that you wanna be thinking about is that if you're shifting the parts of the diencephalon down and compressing the fibers that are going to the red nucleus. You know the red nucleus is important for being able to play a role with inflection, particularly of the upper extremities, more distal flexion. What happens if you have cortical fibers? You know you have cortical rubral fibers that actually come from the cortex, they go down to the red nucleus. And these fibers are generally what? They're inhibitory. These cortical fibers going to the red nucleus are usually inhibitory. And then from here, these will go down, spinal cord, and then go out to the muscles and cause them generally to contract, right? That's the whole goal is you have the rubrospinal tract. If I compress and I damage the actual inhibitory neurons that are supposed to be going to the red nucleus, is this red nucleus is receiving any inhibition anymore? 
No, because the cortical fibers are being compressed from the diencephalon. So now there's no cortical inhibition. So now the red nucleus can just go ham and start firing and firing and firing. So if it increases the action potentials from the red nucleus, what's that going to do? Well, now I have more of the red nucleus firing leading to what? Flexion. And so they start to have this kind of posturing. What is this posturing called? A decorticate posturing. And so because of that, if you have this diencephalic shift and you damage the fibers above the red nucleus, this can lead to what's called a decorticate posturing. Now this can progress if not reversed or treating the underlying mass effect, it can progress to a decerebrate posturing. Okay, but generally damage above the red nucleus, you get decorticate posturing. All right, and so the last one here that you may see is because you're having this diencephalic shift, you may actually, again, there's more midbrain compression from diencephalic shifts, but you actually may start to involve some of like the pontine breathing patterns, and you're just gonna start seeing some abnormal breathing activity. And so sometimes with these, this abnormal breathing, you may see a very kind of like classical case, um, and this is called uh, Chain Stokes breathing. And so I'll kind of demonstrate what um, Chain Stokes breathing looks like. But again, this may be something that will show up in the early stages here. So Chain Stokes breathing is kind of, you have this progressive um, hyperpnea. So it's hypopnea and then complete apnea. So it's again, if you kind of like drew it out here a little bit, it would kind of have hypop, you'd have this hyperpnea that would be progressively building up and then you would have this progressive hypopnea and then you would have an apneic period. And then after that, you'd have that same thing where you have that periodic increase in breathing and then hypopnea and then again back into an apneic period. Okay, so that's something that you may see with this. All right, so we covered subfalcine herniation. We covered diencephalic shift with a transtentorial aspect. There's another type of transtentorial herniation that we have to talk about, which is one of the most important ones, if not the most uh, significant one to remember here is called uncle herniation. Now, uncle herniation is a very, very interesting one. And this is the one that you're gonna see on your exams more than any other herniation syndrome. Now, what happens with this one? All right, same kind of concept here. You get this mass effect, right, from the actual, like, uh, this epidural hematoma causing mass effect on the brain. Well, as this continues to occur, what may start to happen is you may start to push the actual temporal lobe. You know the most medial part of the temporal lobe, if I were to kind of just create like a, an imaginary circle here. Let's say this is the most medial aspect of the temporal lobe. This part here that I'm kind of dashing out is called the uncus. It's like the medial aspect of the temporal lobe. What happens is whenever you get this mass effect from this bleed, the uncus will actually slip. What is this purple thing here called? Again, what is it called? the tentorium cerebelli. The space between that is where that tentorial incisure is. What happens is the uncus will slip over the tentorium and start compressing onto structures around the midbrain. What can happen is, first thing, whenever you get this uncle herniation, you put shearing force and stress on that basilar artery. What is that called whenever you put a lot of shearing force and cause little ruptures of the basilar artery perforators in the pons? It's called Duret's hemorrhage or Duret's hemorrhage. Okay, I'm just gonna put Durette's. But there's gonna be a bleed there. All right, so if the uncus slips through that tentorial incisure and starts compressing on different structures near the midbrain, what can it compress? It can compress the third nerve. If you compress the cranial nerve three, you can get a cranial nerve three palsy, right? Now what's important to know about this is this is ipsilateral cranial nerve three palsy. So the uncus would kind of compress onto this structure. And what would happen is the eye would move down and out because you want to be able to be able to immediately, the medial rectus is all jacked up, the superior rectus is all jacked up, and so because of that, it goes down and out. The other thing is you're affecting the parasympathetic fibers, which normally help to be able to control constriction of the pupil. Those aren't working, so now the pupil will dilate. And so you'll have a dilated pupil that is fixed. In other words, it's kind of like non-reactive. So that could be a sign of uncle herniation. The next thing, is the uncus can also compress onto the cerebral peduncles. You know the cerebral peduncles? You have these uh, motor fibers that actually run through here. So you have the corticospinal tracts that will actually come down through these. 
and they'll move down through the cerebral peduncle and eventually what will happen? They'll go down through the pons, they'll go down through the medulla, and then at the medulla they'll cross, okay, and then go to the muscles on the contralateral side of the body. If you compress at this part, what will happen? Well, you're compressing at the part before the decussation. And so all the fibers from this point downwards are gonna be affected. So you're gonna develop a contralateral hemiplasia. So what can happen here? You develop a contralateral hemiplasia. Now here's where it gets really interesting and they love to throw this on the exam. If the uncle herniation becomes so significant that it continues to push on the midbrain and shift and push the midbrain to the other side to where the other cerebral peduncle will get mashed against the tentorium cerebelli right here. So here we're gonna say here's the tentorium here. If you cause this uncle herniation to really smash and push the midbrain towards the other side, it'll compress this other cerebral peduncle against the tentorium cerebelli, affecting the muscles, the, the actual corticospinal tracts that are moving through this part of the cerebral peduncle. So then what else can happen? So now these fibers are gonna be affected, which move down here, and eventually what will they do? They'll cross and go down to the muscles on the contralateral side. So, this right here is a very, very special thing where you can get weakness that presents on the same side of the herniation. What do they call that whenever you have weakness that occurs on the same side of the herniation? They call this Kernahan's notch. Okay? So, really quick recap again. Uncle herniation you compress the ipsilateral cerebral peduncle. The fibers that are moving through that cerebral peduncle eventually will cross at the medulla, go to the muscles on the contralateral side. You get a contralateral hemiplasia, right? That is also associated with an ipsilateral third nerve palsy. Over time, if that uncus continues to push on the midbrain and pushes it enough that it causes the contralateral cerebral peduncle to get compressed against the tentorium cerebelli, then those fibers will be affected. They come down, they cross, they go to the muscles that is on the same side of where the herniation is. This is called Kernahan's notch. It's also known as a false localizing sign. Very big thing that they love to ask on the exams. The last thing that I want you guys to remember is that sometimes when you get an uncle herniation, they love to compress this vessel right here at the top of the posterior circulation. You guys remember your vertebrals, then you have your pica, then you have your ica, superior cerebellar, what's this one? The posterior cerebral artery. So sometimes you can compress the posterior cerebral artery and that can affect going to the visual center. So you may develop some homonymous hemianopia. You may affect the thalamus. You even may affect parts of the midbrain. And so think about all your PCA stroke syndrome types of symptoms. That's what you may say here. So this is uncle herniation and by far one of the most important ones to remember out of everything else. All right, so the other thing that we wanna remember here besides the herniation symptoms, the subfalcy and the diencephalic shift and the uncle herniation, you can also have other signs of increased intracranial pressure due to the uh, epidural hematoma. So one of the big things here is that there could actually be kind of compression around the optic nerve. And if you compress the optic nerve, you affect the actual venous drainage from that actual vessels here that are running through the optic nerve. And it causes the disc to become really blurred and edematous and difficult to be able to make out the margins of the optic disc when you're looking on on the fundoscopic exam. And so this can present as the classical sign here, which you guys need to remember, called papilla edema. The next thing that you guys need to remember here is that there can also be compression of a very important cranial nerve. Very important to remember this one. Whenever there is high intracranial pressure, compression of the sixth nerve. So sometimes there can be a sixth nerve palsy. And one of the most common symptoms when you have a six nerve palsy is whenever you're trying to track different objects, you develop a significant double vision or diplopia. Okay. The next thing is that sometimes whenever there's high intracranial pressure, there can be a lot of compression onto a very, very special structure here that is located in the medulla called the chemo trigger zone. The chemo trigger zone near the area postrema is basically a center that is very sensitive. Whenever it gets compressed due to high intracranial pressure, it can trigger nausea and vomiting. So another thing to remember here is nausea and vomiting. All right, and so the last thing that I want you guys to remember is there's a very special type of triad. It's called Cushing's 
triad. Now Cushing's triad is usually again due to very high intracranial pressure and there's compression particularly at the medulla level and you're altering the cardiovascular as well as the respiratory centers within the brainstem. And so what happens is your body tries to create a way of increasing blood flow to the brain to perfuse the brain. And so it increases the blood pressure, but resultingly it leads to a low heart rate or bradycardia. So you can develop hypertension, bradycardia, but it also alters the way that we breathe, very irregular types of breathing. So you can develop a very irregular type of breathing pattern, which is important to remember. Okay, so these are the big signs. Now the last thing that you guys can remember here is that because there's any time there is cortical compression due to an actual bleed, there's always high risk of seizures. So sometimes a clinical presentation can also be seizures. All right, so this covers the aspect of the herniation and high intracranial pressure. Let's cover other things that are very important to pick up on your exams as other clinical features in epidural hematomas. All right, so the next thing that I want you guys to remember that's very important to pick up on the exam is that sometimes if there is significant trauma, sometimes there can be leakage of CSF and there can actually be blood within the CSF and sometimes you can pick that up. So anytime someone has a very significant traumatic event, I know it sounds crazy, but you want to look to see if there's any leakage of cerebrospinal fluid from the ear called CSF otorrhea. So sometimes there can be some leakage of CSF, okay? You want to look for otorrhea. The other thing you want to look for is, is there any CSF leakage from the actual nasal cavity? Whenever they had some type of fracture there, was that fracture leading to a CSF leak there? Is there any CSF rhinorrhea? Okay. Now, how do we do that? There's a couple different ways that you can look for that. You can take the classic way that they say is you take a little bit of that CSF and you dab it onto a little kind of like paper towel or kind of like little gauze pad. And what you may see is you may see the CSF kind of form like this ring and then the blood may kind of form in the center of that because some of that CSF will start to spread out from that central portion. And so what this can do is this can kind of present with like this thing called a halo sign. Okay, so that's something that you may do is you may take some of the actual cerebrospinal fluid that's leaking from the nasal cavity or from the ear, put it on a little kind of like pad or gauze and look for a halo sign. Now that's not always the best. So sometimes what you can do is there's very specific proteins that are found in CSF and you can also do what's called a beta two transferrin test to look for to see if that protein comes up positive from that actual exudator leakage. All right, that covers that. So again, look for CSF rhinorrhea, CSF otorrhea, halo sign is a big thing, but you can also take a beta-2 transferrin test. What else can we think about? If someone has trauma, a big thing to think for and look for, especially on the exam, they love to ask this, is any signs of kind of hematomas that are forming behind the ear. And so sometimes they call this kind of a battle sign, right? So you may pick up kind of this hematoma that forms around the ear, and this may be indicative of a basilar skull fracture. So you want to look for what's called a battle sign. The other thing that you want to look for is do they have any kind of hematoma around the eyes? Again, that can be indicative of maybe some type of like frontal or nasal bone fracture. You may see this as what's called a raccoon sign. So again, look for these two things. This can kind of show up and be indicative of some type of significant traumatic event, raccoon sign or battle sign. So the other thing to look for besides, again, CSF renorrhea, otorrhea, battle sign, or raccoon sign, is is there any blood that's leaking from the actual tympanic membrane? Because again, that could be a sign of trauma, some type of basilar skull fracture as well. So again, look for any hemo tympanum. So again, I think these are all big, big things to be able to think about whenever you have someone coming in with a traumatic event, you suspect an epidural hematoma, they say, hey, I'm coming in, I lost consciousness, I'm kind of awake, I'm alert, I do have a headache, they start deteriorating, start showing signs of herniation syndromes as we talked about above. We talk about all the different signs of trauma such as CSF rhinorrhea, otorrhea, as well as 
any type of battle sign, raccoon sign, and hemotympan. Putting that together and then saying, okay, I think this person may have an epidural hematoma. What am I gonna do next? Well, I gotta diagnose this. How do I diagnose it? The big, big thing that you need to start off with is you can get some labs to go run and cook while you start ordering particular imaging. What are the labs that you can throw in to start cooking while you get them to go and send them to get a CT scan? You can send off some coags, uh, some co uh, coagulopathic labs. So in other words, what am I looking for? Remember one of the particular causes that we mentioned, not as common, but it can be seen, is coagula uh, coagulopathies. Does the person have low platelets? Are they on any anticoagulants? Well, one of the things that you can do is, do you take any anticoagulants? Ask them that in their history. Do you take any anticoagulants? Do you take any antiplatelets? If they don't, okay, you can kind of move on. It doesn't hurt though to check an INR or an, and a PTT. So some of the things that you can throw off to check their coags is you can check a PT, INR, and you can check a PTT. The, probably the bigger one here is gonna be the INR. Because again, if they did take warfarin and they just don't remember, you can check their INR, look to see if it's elevated or super therapeutic. Or if they have like a liver failure and they're not aware of it, they drink a lot of alcohol, they have some underlying cause for liver failure, that may be kind of a liver-related coagulopathy. And you can reverse that. You can give them particular medications. The other thing is to check a CBC. Why? Check their platelets. Are their platelet, do they have like a platelet of like two? And that's why they're bleeding massively into their brain. So you need to check, do they have a thrombocytopenia? Are they taking any anticoagulants and antiplatelets? And check to see and just verify that their actual coag parameters are within a normal therapeutic range. While that's cooking though, they should be going to get a stat CT scan. When you get a CT scan of the head, you really, you just wanna do this without contrast. So CT scan of the head. What you're gonna do is, is you're gonna look for a couple different features that they love to ask you on the exam. The first thing is that if you look at the bleed, it takes on this very particular type of biconcave kind of shape or lens shaped type of bleed. So we call this a lens shaped bleed. Okay, so when we see this lens-shaped bleed, that's one big thing to think about. The next thing that you wanna remember here is not only is it lens-shaped, but when you have these things called sutures here, all right, so you have these sutures, these fibrous different types of tissues here, what's important to remember about epidural hematomas is that they do not cross the suture lines. Okay, that's another big thing. And the other thing is if you're looking for a bleed, it's usually the bleed itself is gonna be very hyper dense. It's gonna be white. That's gonna show up on the CT scan. So you may see what's called a hyper dense type of bleed. Now, what else could we do? The other thing that you wanna do is you can do what's called windowing of the image. And when you window it, you look for the, through the bone windows to look to see if you can find any fracture that shows up on that CT scan. Wherever there is actually the break in the bone that could potentially say, oh, there's the reason they fractured that portion of the actual temporal bone, and there is why they have this actual bleed there. So again, going through and remembering it's lens shaped or kind of like this bi, kind of like a concave kind of shape here, or it doesn't cross suture lines. The bleed itself is very white, hyper dense, and look for a fracture when you threw it through the bone windows. You can order other tests. You can get things like an MRI. Um, you can order even imaging labs, but again, these are not generally something that you're gonna order. You're gonna pretty much stick with the CT scan. That'll give you much what you need, but you can't go on further to further evaluate epidurals with MRI and other imaging modalities. But this is kind of the bread and butter here, coags, CT scan. All right, so when we're treating an epidural hematoma, what is the big things to remember? Okay, so first things first is if this is a coagulopathy, related types of uh, epidural hematoma, which it can happen. Those are things that you can quickly and easily kind of reverse. So for example, it's important to remember to reverse the coagulopathy. Now, we're not gonna go through every type of issue here, but for example, if the person was on warfarin, what would you give them? Well, you give them vitamin K, and you would also give them what's called PCC, so prothrombin complex concentrate. To give you another example, if they were taking heparin for some reason, you would give them what's called protamine sulfate. 
And again, we're not gonna go through all the other types, but the other thing to think about is, what if it's not just an anticoagulant related thing? What if they actually have very, very low platelets? So sometimes if people have very low platelets, this could be a potential cause. Now, whenever the platelets get really low, generally like less than 50,000, now some will actually say that platelets less than 100,000, there's high risk of intracranial bleeds. But generally, whenever the platelets are like less than 50,000, that's kind of a time to maybe transfuse. And whenever you transfuse, you transfuse to a particular goal. If they're gonna get a neurosurgical procedure, you should transfuse to a goal to get the platelets greater than 80K. So some will say greater than or equal to 80K would be the goal if they're going to intervene. Okay, if they're not, you just keep the platelets just a little bit greater than 50K. But again, that's the quick thing to do. The most important thing is if this mass effect is so significant, it's causing neurological deterioration as we mentioned above, the best thing to do is to have a neurosurgical intervention. And so what they may do is, if you can't get them to an OR, this is an emergent situation. You see these on TV. <laughs> they may do what's called a burr hole. Uh, this isn't the best thing to do. It's kind of a temporizing measure that you can do. But the most important thing to do is to actually go in and do what's called a kind of a craniotomy or craniectomy here and actually kind of you do a crany and then you actually evacuate the blood out of there, out of the epidural uh, 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 space. And so that would kind of be like the gold standard is actually going in, popping off a piece of the skull and evacuating out that hematoma. Okay, now just because we did mention that if someone has a spinal epidural hematoma, this isn't uh, super common, but what you can do is you can actually cut the lamina off, pull that off and then evacuate that blood there. And so doing what's called a laminectomy like a decompressive laminectomy may be something that you do, particularly for a spinal epidural hematoma that's actually causing like significant compression, cauda equina types of symptoms. The next thing to remember is, the most important thing is gonna be neurosurgical intervention. Burr hole, not too common, but craniotomy with an evacuation is big, or laminectomy if it's spinal, reverse the coagulopathy. The other thing is if you have to temporize them, maybe they're having some difficulty being able to get them to the OR at this point in time or you just need to medically manage them for the moment. Sometimes what you'll do is you'll do intracranial pressure management. And so what does that consist of? Well, remember that if people have high intracranial pressure, some of the ways that you can treat this is you can give things like mannitol, or you can give things like hypertonic saline in the form of 23.4%, there's 3%, things like that. But it's just a very short temporizing measure to control their ICPs as you bridge them to the surgical intervention. The last thing to talk about is this is becoming a newer type of technology or newer type of intervention that is really, really helpful in people with epidural hematomas is you actually can go in and take an embolize. So imagine here I have like a catheter and then from this catheter, I kind of spray off maybe like a gel and I embolize off the middle meningeal artery. If I embolize the middle meningeal artery, I embolize the source of the bleed. That is also a treatment modality as well. And so we call this a middle meningeal artery embolization. And so this may be an option for individuals with an epidural hematoma. All right, so this covers epidural hematoma. All right, Ninja Nerd, so in this video, we talk about epidural hematoma. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys did really enjoy it. Also, just as kind of an update, a heads up, the website, the Ninja Nerd website is coming soon, so please stay tuned for that. All right, Ninja Nerds, as always, until next time.